Uh, I'm so excited to welcome Sharon Eubank back to BYU. Uh, Sister Sharon Eubank is uh, a graduate of BYU in the humanities and makes it back this way once in a while. Uh, her topic today is putting the human into humanitarian efforts. Uh, she has been the global director of Latter-day Saint Charities, which is the humanitarian organization of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, for more than a decade. Uh, she started an employment in the welfare department of the church in 1998, working to establish church employment offices in Africa and Europe, as well as directing the Latter-day Saint uh, Charities Wheelchair Initiative. In 2008, she became regional director of Latter-day Saint Charities in the Middle East, where she served for a number of years before becoming director of Latter-day Saint Charities worldwide. Uh, many of you also know her from uh, her church leadership experience. She served on the Relief Society General Board from 2009 to 2012, and served as the first counselor of the General Relief Society Presidency from 2017 to 2022. Uh, Sharon is one of my heroes. I think that she is a marvelous example uh, of the potential that each of us has to provide leadership in God's kingdom. Uh, and uh, really an outstanding example of service and leadership for those of us who serve, who strive to be disciples of Christ. Please join me in welcoming Sharon. about the uh, lecture series, if I had been a student here, I would have been too intimidated to come in and sit down. I would have been lurking up there, looking for somebody that I know. I was so shy that it was very hard for me to take advantage of something like this. So I say that to encourage all of you. You managed to walk in the door, sit down, and engage in a, in a topic, so well done. Well done on that. I loved my experience at BYU. I was I was very grateful in hindsight, looking back, to be able to have studied secular topics in the light of my faith and to be able to combine those things. That's a pretty rare privilege. And you're heavily subsidized as students here at Brigham Young University. And there are a lot of people who would love to be sitting in your chair. And so the only thing that you can really do is to make sure that you study something and you apply your long knowledge and your faith so that other people get the benefit of that because you're here on the on the shoulders and the foundation of a lot of other people who did a lot of other things. I love this topic about how to build civil society. I'm glad that you're studying about that this semester and this idea of putting the human, human spirit into humanitarian or putting the civil back in civil society got me excited, so that's what I thought I would talk about today. I don't know if you're familiar with the poet Naomi Shihab Nye. She wrote a poem about an experience she had in 2008. So she was in the airport, and she heard over the loudspeaker someone say, is there anyone in the airport who speaks Arabic? If you could come to C7 or A4, whatever the gate was. And she thought, okay, I do speak Arabic. So she made her way to the gate. And when she got there, there was a woman in traditional Palestinian dress, and she's on the floor sobbing. So she says to the gate agent, is there anything I can do? And he said, the flight has been delayed, but I don't know that she understands that. She thinks that the flight is canceled or something, but she's distraught. So Naomi knelt down on the floor next to her, put her arm around her, and began to speak to her in Arabic. And as soon as the woman heard that, this, that, that there was an Arabic speaker, she just poured out her fear and frustration that she was to meet her son in Chicago, now it was all canceled, she was afraid she was going to be stranded, she didn't know how to communicate. Once she understood that it was delayed and it was going to leave in 45 minutes and that Naomi would help her call her son on the phone, everything calmed down. So this woman took a big breath and this is, this is actually the poem that she wrote, but I'm going to read about it. She says, she was laughing a lot by then, telling about her life, answering questions. Soon after, she pulled a sack of homemade mahmoul cookies, little powdered sugar, crumbly mounds stuffed with dates and nuts, out of her bag, and was offering them to all the women at the gate. To my amazement, not a single woman declined a cookie. It was like a sacrament. The traveler from Argentina, the traveler from California, the lovely woman from Laredo, we were all covered with the same powdered sugar. And smiling, there are no better cookies. 
And I looked around the gate of late and weary ones and I thought, this is the world I want to live in, the shared world. Not a single person in that gate, once the crying of the confusion stopped, seemed apprehensive about any other person. They took the cookies. I wanted to hug all of those other women too. This can still happen anywhere. Not everything is lost. That's a wonderful little example, and I share it because it's so small. When we are talking about the, the inflection points for humanness in humanitarian or civil in civil society, it is not the giant building blocks that are carved out of government programs or university projects. It is the mortar of the individual experience like this that holds it together. If that mortar disappears, the whole thing comes crashing down. And each one of us can do that, but it isn't as big as we think. It, it hinges on small human acts of compassion and kindness. So, as, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, as people of covenant, as Christians, we have covenantal responsibility to learn how to be that order. And we don't talk about it enough. We're focused on the big things. We're focused on our master's thesis and on the project that has to be done, and the, the big things. And we think if we're not doing those things, we are not contributing in, in a big way. But my great testimony is when we look back on our lives, it will be the small human things that make a big difference. I have a friend from the Middle East, and he said, you Americans. He said, you try to get, you try to get work done by leveraging your relationships. He said, we Middle Easterners, we try, to, we try to build our relationships by leveraging work. That was very impactful to me. Are our relationships instrumental to getting our thing done, or are they the end in and of itself? So the BYU experience and the Kennedy Center particularly is a wonderful privilege for people of covenant to learn by study and also by faith. So I'm going to be talking about small human things that I feel in my 25 years of experience make a difference. They made a difference to me because, as I said, I was too shy and too unacquainted with, with even how a university system actually worked. I was lost. And it took me a long time to find my way. You're all ahead of me. <laughs> so I'm very grateful to be here with you. <clears throat> We know that we have covenantal obligations to do certain things, to, to gather rather than scatter, to build up rather than tear down, to you know, hold the hands of widows and orphans. We know those covenantal things. But it's so hard in the complex world that we live in to know how to do it. The, the genius, the superpower, is in knowing what to do or how to do it. So I want to talk about that today because there's various estimates, but over the last 50 years, the world has probably spent nearly $3 trillion in humanitarian aid. And somebody raise their hand and tell me one place that we've solved it. Because we haven't. And $3 trillion later, we're still trying to think about what is it that really works, what really makes a difference. So, I'm going to show you some pictures. Well, this, there you go. So here's my... If you read in the New Testament, Jesus says, all right, I'm going to tell you the how. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If what? You have love one to another. Lucky for us, in the Restoration Scriptures, he starts to, to encourage us and give us some examples of other ways. So I'm going to show you five scriptures that come out of the Doctrine and Covenants and the Book of Mormon that kind of augment this, this uh, encouragement from Jesus. If you want to be my disciples, this is how people will know that you're my disciples, that you love one another. And not and one another, not just meaning us ourselves, but everybody, the way Jesus loved everybody. All right, so here, here they are. Anybody know who that is? It's a very young Elder Ballard, President Ballard. He was the newest apostle. In 19, he was called in 1985, his picture was taken in 1986. Now he's the senior apostle, he's the president of the Quorum of the Twelve. But at that time, there was a cyclical famine going on in Ethiopia. There happens to be another one right now. But he was sent, after the church did that very special fast in 1985, most of you don't remember this, but I was a missionary during that time, and the whole church, at President Kimball's request, fasted. 
and gave what we would have spent on food, that fast offering, for, uh, for famine relief in Ethiopia. But the church had no mechanism to deliver that aid. So uh, President Ballard, as a young apostle, was sent, along with uh, someone from the presiding bishop's office, to go figure out what should we do with the $6 million that the church has donated. So there he is. He told a story about being in that camp, it's a feeding center, and an Ethiopian man stumbled in. He'd come in from the desert, he'd been walking many days, and he was carrying a child, a little infant. And he held up that infant in his arms, and he said, as he walked in, is, can anybody help this baby? And President Ballard told the story, got really emotional, because he said that man had been walking for nine days, and he could have said, I need help, so, I need water. You know, it, it could have been about him. And he was the very poorest of the poor, but it was about the baby. That man was walking toward the feeding center when he heard a child cry off the side of the road, and he left the road, he walked into the little uh, series of huts, and he found that child held in its mother's arms, but the mother had died. So they're lying on the ground. So he picked up the baby, and he walked the rest of the way in. And his first instinct was, what can be done for this baby? That's an important detail, because every one of us are givers, and every one of us are receivers. And it doesn't matter how disadvantaged you are, you are still a giver. And it doesn't matter how wealthy you are, you're still a receiver. That principle in the Doctrine and Covenants that we're all givers and all receivers is foundational to the kind of work that we're doing. So that you don't ever feel like, I've been given so much, I will come and help you. Or that somebody, you know, we often say, oh, they're so poor, they have nothing. Those kinds of things are disempowering on both sides. We should never say those kinds of things. And this principle helps us. So the scripture that goes along with President Bowman says, out of Alma 130, and thus, in their prosperous circumstances, they did not send away any who were naked, hungry, thirst, sick, or that did not be nourished, and they did not set their hearts upon riches. Therefore, they were liberal to all, both old and young, both bond and free, both male and female, whether out of the church or in the church, having no respect to persons as to those who stood in need. I really love that encouragement from both. This is a picture that was taken during the pandemic down at the Navajo Nation. Now, I don't know which of those people has brought the food and which of those people are receiving the food. It doesn't really matter. Look at their faces. Even the man who's wearing the mask, you can see in his eyes, he's happy to be there. And the other man in the stocking cap, he's just, he's just thrilled at what's going on this day. Now, I don't know which of them is delivering and which of them is receiving. But look at the conditions in their clothes. If you blow that photo up, you can see on the man on the left, his hands are as black and as cracked. He spent a lot of time outdoors. And that jacket spent a lot of time outdoors, and that hat has, you know, seen a lot of action. <laughs> and yet they're doing something together in that very difficult moment in the Navajo Nation where they had such high deaths, and they had so few access to services, and, and all their resources, many of their resources, had been withdrawn and cut off. So this was a moment of hope in that experience in the, in the pandemic, and I really like that. The scripture that goes along with this comes out of Doctrine and Covenants 104. If you're a student of humanitarian doctrine, this is one of the core scriptures. I, the Lord, stretched out the heavens and built the earth by very handiwork, and all things that are in mine. And it's my purpose to provide for my saints. But it must be done in my own way, that the poor shall be exalted and that the rich shall be I just took these pictures off the internet. Because if you think about, if you have never heard a word that President Nelson said, and all you have are his visual evidences of what he is doing to try and show that he's a disciple of Jesus Christ and to love one another. Look at these photos. He's picking up little children. He's embracing and trying to heal wounds that have been uh, inflicted in the past. He's, there he is in Christchurch, New Zealand, where that, that bombing happened in the mosque. And, and saying that he'll pray for the doctor of the, of the people who were injured and pray for those who uh, were killed. And, and a listening to other leaders speak and being a good listener as well as a good leader. And listening to Sister Bingham talk something, something that's interesting to her. Those kinds of things, that's just a visual evidence of somebody who is trying to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Here's the scripture I chose for President Nelson. 
and let every man esteem his brother as himself, and practice virtue and holiness before me. And I say unto you, be one, and if ye are not one, ye are not mine. It's easy to talk about that, and we have lofty devotions about being one, but to practice it takes very intentional skills. And this is one of the things that you could be learning as part of your studies here. How do you be one with people? How do you actually do it? And if we had the time here, I would ask you, tell me what it takes to have those skills. Maybe we'll have a little bit of time. How many people in this room have participated in, in some kind of a helping hands activity? All right, lots of you. It's not about the shirt. It's not about the photo that shows up in the church news. What is it really about? It's about that. It's about that woman who's at one of the hardest moments in her life, and there is somebody there who's helping her, and she overcomes. She just puts her arms around that person in gratitude, in suffering, in grief. But the point is, they were there. They were there in proximity at the right time to offer that kind of comfort and relief to somebody. So yeah, it's about the chainsaws, and it's about the, the mucking out of stuff, and it's about wearing a yellow shirt, but it's not really. It's really about that. And you don't really need to wear a yellow shirt to be able to do that. People call me up all the time in my office. They say, Sister Eubank, I, I love humanitarian. I want to be a humanitarian. I want this to be my career. What advice do you have for me? You know what I say? I ask them, all right, tell me about the person you minister to. There's this silence on the <laughs> Those skills are the exact same skills. If you love humanitarian, another word for that is ministering to somebody. Ministering isn't going to visit somebody once a month and, and just, you know, having some kind of an awkward interaction. It's listening to them. It's finding out what's going on in their life. It's being present in those difficult times. It's, it's loving. It's humanitarian. It's charity. It's all the same thing. But we box it up in little boxes, and then we forget about what it is we're really doing. So, there's my pitch for minister. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is Mosiah 2.17. There's a food bank down in Las Vegas, and they put this quote on their food bank wall. They're not members of the church, but they love this quote, and it encourages the people of Las Vegas for this food bank. So, I tell you these things, that ye may learn wisdom, that ye may learn that when you are in the service of your fellow beings, ye are only in the service of your so here is the photo that um, I, I bring along with this idea of peacemaking. A lot of you are studying conflict resolution, peacemaking, politics, you know, all, all of those things, social cohesion. It's important, but the way that we do it comes down to personal. It won't ever matter what your educational models are or what your societal you know, theses are, it comes down, unfortunately or fortunately, to personal interactions. So who's the guy on the left? Does anybody know who that is? Martin Van Buren. Martin Van Buren, very well, that's why you're a professor. <laughs> <laughs> He's the prof he was the president of the United States when Joseph Smith went to him trying to get redress for the saints who had been disenfranchised, their property had been taken, uh, they had been murdered, and he went to the highest levels of government trying to get help. What did Martin Van Buren say? He's in an election, you know, an election's coming up, and he says to the, the saints, Your cause is just, but I can do nothing. Imagine that that's what you're known for. Well, you know, nobody knows Martin Van Buren except for your cause is just, but I can do nothing for you. Now think about the contrast between his education, his standing, his power, and Joseph Smith and his education and his standing. And the power that he had came through the priesthood. And now, 200 years later almost, what do we know about Joseph Smith? One of the most important things for me is this scripture in the Doctrine and Covenants. Now it's the voice of Jesus brought to us through the prophet Joseph Smith, and it's for every one of us. Sue for peace. Not only for the people that have smitten you, but to all people. And lift up an ensign of peace and make a proclamation of peace under the ends of the earth. Now this is you. If you're covenantal people, this is specifically for you. Make proposals for peace under those who have smitten you, according to the voice of the Spirit which is in you. And all things shall work together for your good. 
It's an interesting contrast between those two leaders. And I'm not going to write Mark Van Buren off. Maybe sometime in his life he'll repent and, and he'll have the opportunity. But for us, looking at these two historical figures, we have the opportunity not to say, your cause is just, but I can't do anything for you, but to say, I'll sue for peace. Even if you've been against me, even if you've hurt me, I will plead your cause because that's who I am. I'm a follower of the Prince of Peace. And that means something to me, and I hope it means something to you. So now we're back to my question. How come money doesn't solve humanitarian crises? You can read in the newspaper, the church has amassed a stockpile of money. Why aren't they using that to solve humanitarian problems? Why doesn't money solve humanitarian problems? And this is, I'm asking you, what's, let me hear from three people. Why do you think $3 trillion later, we haven't made any perfect place. Well, giving money to the needy generally creates a sense of dependency. They, when they receive something, they're expecting more, and it kind of uh, downplays self-reliance. All right, money, just on its own, doesn't really build up people's abilities to be resilient and, and take care of themselves, self-reliance. Because the problems often go way deeper than just there's a lot of historical and cultural problems. What are you studying? Sociology. Well, we have to talk to your professors because that is exactly right. Problems run a lot deeper than the surface issues of what's going on with money. So we throw money at things and then we're disappointed when it doesn't solve those cultural and societal issues. They exist for a reason. Everything is, is designed to exist because of the forces that are at play. And money only distorts those forces most of the time. Let me hear one more. They've outdone you, so I need to <laughs> show that you're here for a reason. Go ahead. Um, yeah, just to kind of add on to that, it's just like you can't. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you, um, it's a behavior thing. You can provide money to people that help them have clean water, but if you can't teach them to filter the water or how to use the filtration system that you're providing, it's just money that goes to waste. You have to teach people how to become better and how to learn these new ways that the church is trying to provide or other humanitarian organizations are trying to provide this behavior. Perfectly said. Money doesn't change behavior permanently. It distorts it, but it doesn't. It takes different forces to be able to change people's behavior in other ways. So I'm going to teach you, and maybe you already know this, but I'm going to pretend like we're, we're learning this together. What I will teach a 12-year-old, a, a missionary couple, is the most basic part of development. Are you ready? I, I call it UNO principles because the number one UNO thing is the most important, and then you can remember it by the colors. All right, so here we go. UNO. What do the local leaders want? What do the people themselves want? That's the most important thing. You can come in with your ideas and your grant and your funding and your university education. It, that doesn't matter. What do they want? Because you can't affect change unless you're serving the need that they have. The second one, what skills can the beneficiaries themselves offer? Because if you come in there saying, why they have nothing, you just turned them into a victim all over again. You would never want to do that. So I love to ask this question, what have you already tried? What worked? What didn't work? What do you want to do next? That kind of a discussion, they're able to say, all right, these are the things I can do. And then you can have a productive discussion about, are there ways to get the community involved to fill in the gaps? Now, we're talking about civil society. Why do we care so much about getting the community involved? Why don't I just keep this between them and my organization, or them and me? Because it's a lot cleaner. Involving a bunch of volunteers and community is way messier, way longer. Why are we doing that? Because parents love their kids. There's no greater purpose in life than to provide for your kids. If you are in a society that is being broken apart, and people are pushed into little tiny factions, we've forgotten that we're all one family. How do we learn that again? How do we interest somebody in our cause when they're so different from us? When they, when they believe totally different things and their experience is very different? What's the mechanism to bring those forces back together with something in common? You, you've got you to do some kind of project together. 
You've got to stand by each other and talk to each other while you do some activity with your hands so that you get to know each other. And that is not complicated, but it is so hard to make happen because we forget about it. Now I'm going to get off this little slide and I'm going to give you my pitch. Just Serve is an app and it's a website. Fine. There's billions of them. You all know that. And I'm not trying to push Just Serve on you, but what is the way that you, as a student or as faculty or as a member of the Society of Provo, what are you going to do to get to know somebody from the mosque or from the Lutheran church or from Baha'i? How will you physically interact with them? How will you meet them? This is one way that you can do that. So, just as an insight into my work, I've been working for two and a half years to get this, uh, this technical update that is going today at 10 o'clock. So this whole website is going to change, and it's going to be so much better tonight at 10. <laughs> so don't look today, but go home tomorrow. <laughs> you can download that app, and it'll be different. But let me just show you a couple things on there. You can filter, and you're going to say, you know what, I, I, I just want to do something for my group. I want to take my family home evening group out. And I want to do only thing where they need Arabic speakers. I mean, yeah. but you can filter on all those things, and it will filter for you, and then it will bring up opportunities. We saw that on the page. There were 272 opportunities just around the issues that were. And then you can say, hey, if an Arabic opportunity comes along, send me an email. Or you can fill out your profile, and it will let you know some of those things. If, if you go and serve, it's going to keep track of your service profile so that when you want to apply for your PhD, you go to just serve and print off all your volunteer hours on your area of expertise and you include that in your, in your application. Because service is meaningful in our society. People want to see that. So here's some things you could have done today. You could help in the Huntsman Games. They need people to help with skiing and the registration. You can go to Altaview Elementary and help kids fill out worksheets. Or you can be a math tutor. Those are just the top three. I just put those in. Why would the church spend all that time and all that effort and all the energy doing something like that? Why are we, why are we trying to have an app to encourage people to volunteer? But it's part of the time. Will you please write about that? It's, <laughs> this, is, this is exactly what Zion is. It's knitting parts together so that every man seeking the interest of his neighbor, every woman seeking the interest of her neighbor. And we know that intellectually, but we don't have opportunities to practice these as much as we could. So here's a way to practice. So if you're with young single adults and you want to do something, or family will be or your family, or a reunion, or on and on and on, look for ways that you and your group can get to know some other group, because that weaves social fabric. Oh, you can also submit a project, too. If you have a great project, you can submit it on there, and it'll come up, and other people can help you. All right, back to if you invite your community and friends. The fourth thing on this, this little group is, is the idea sustainable? And what I mean by sustainable is, will the community structure be stronger to address that problem when it comes up next year? Or are they going to come find you and say, I need your help again? <laughs> So in order to be sustainable, you want to build the structure, the ability for them to solve this problem on their own. And then the last one, is it a local solution that can be replicated by local people? Now I'll just give you a little example. Somebody put a flyer on my door where I live in North Salt Lake and said, we're collecting shoes for kids in Afghanistan. That sounds wonderful. But what's the problem with that? Have the kids in Afghanistan not had shoes for 2,000 years? What are they doing for shoes right now? They use tires. They cut tires up and they make, they make flip-flops out of those. And what happens when we bring a bunch of Nikes and Adidas and Spangle High Heels and all of the stuff that will get donated, and we spend all that money to ship it across the ocean, and somebody clears it out of customs, and they open it up? What have we just said to everybody there? Your local solution is no good. We're going to bring you some other solution that you can never replicate again and, and create a, a, a market or destroy a local market for something that isn't necessary. So look for local solutions that can be replicated by, local, by the local people. I can't tell you the times that we have imported technology from Germany. We put beautiful um, solar panels on our, on our pump in the well in Ethiopia, thinking tons of 
sunshine, perfect, and two weeks later a hailstorm came and broke out all the solar panels. And the only place to repair it was Germany. <laughs> so think through those things, I'm begging you from my own experience. These five UNO principles are the foundational and the core if you want to help people and if they want to help you. I'm going to just go through some statistics, and I won't take very long. 385 million children globally live in poverty. Two and a half million babies die annually before they're four weeks old. About 300,000 women a year die in childbirth, and many of them, a surprising number of them, are in the United States. 3.1 million children each year die because of poor nutrition, meaning they're not getting enough nutrition that their muscles grow instead their muscles shrink. Half of all children globally suffer from essential vitamin and mineral deficiencies. And vaccines prevent an estimated two and a half million deaths per year among children under five. If the, if the malaria vaccine comes on, which the uh, trials are very promising as of this year, that number will astronomically change. So why, what are the root uh, drivers in that? There are five basic things. You'll hear people in the news talk about conflict, COVID, and climate change. It's kind of catchy. But that conflict is driving huge amounts of displacement. We see it in Syria. We see it in Ukraine. We don't pay as much attention in northern Ethiopia, in, in eastern DR Congo, some of those places. But the suffering is it's too difficult to even bear, and yet they're living through that. Disease, we've been through some of that with the pandemic, but there's lots of other preventable diseases. Climate change, which is driving so much displacement. Food chain, uh, food supply uh, inequalities and, and diff, uh, disruptions, which we are experiencing ourselves. We get upset when we can't find toilet paper, but it's much, much more important to other people who can't get their crops to market, so they rot in the field and they don't get their money to buy new seed. And then gender inequality. It is always women and girls who suffer more from those, from those uh, inequalities because they don't have as much access. We can do things about these. It's interesting for covenantal people to think about those barriers and what we might do. I brought this, this map will be updated for 2022 in May. This is the 2021 number. You don't have to look at it except to know the, the warmer the color, the more malnutrition is mm -hmm. in those countries. That means up to 35% of children are wasting. It means their, their muscle mass is going backwards and they will die because of malnutrition. How can this be the 21st century? With all our money, with all of our technology, with all of our knowledge and resources, and we still can't feed each other. The First Presidency, the Presiding Bishopric, and the Relief Society Presidency are having discussions about if we could do one thing globally as a church, what would it be? And it's centering on the ideas of prioritizing the well-being of children so that the church can make the most of its worldwide impact and focus on the specific needs of young children and their, their mothers. So, and this would include children that are in the church and children that are outside the church. Well, what would they do? They're thinking about maternal and newborn care, meaning that the mother has a healthy birth, the baby survives, the mother survives. That is, it's not rocket science to do that. You just have to pay attention. And it would solve a lot of suffering. Immunizations, routine immunizations against those deadly killers that don't need to be killing people. Child nutrition. Most kids eat starch. And it's true in the United States, it's true in Kenya, it's true in every place. They eat rice, they eat poi, they eat macaroni and cheese. They don't get the vegetables and the nutrients they need for their brains to grow. If they don't get that and their brains are growing, the window closes when they're five years old. And then you can't make that up. What you got before you were five years old is what you get. So there will be all kinds of kids who will never be able to come to a university because they couldn't finish primary school because they didn't have the cognitive resources, because they didn't have good nutrition. So we talk about pathway, we talk about perpetual education, but we talk about the church schools, but nutrition is the core foundation of that. And then finally would be access to primary education. So think about what this would mean. A child is born healthy, its mother survives, it breastfeeds, it gets immunizations, it eats nutritious food, it has clean water, it enrolls in primary school. That little 
scenario practiced over and over again by the covenantal people of the church would change the face of the world more than the three trillion dollars we've already spent. But it happens because of human interactions. It happens with relationships. People's, people's relationship to food doesn't change because someone tells them to. Nobody's going to stop eating starch and sugar because someone tells them to. You have to have an experience. And we all know that because it's us. These are just pictures about that. So I know this is an old-fashioned sign. I saw the movement there. But it says, you know, enter to learn, go forth to serve. And my question to you is, what are you going to do? I see people taking notes. What are you going to write down for yourself? What are you going to do when you leave this? Thomas Donahue used to be the CEO of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And he said this, and I really like this. Restoring civility is something we all need to take personally and work on every day. We believe that our right to speak carries with it the responsibility to listen, to give others a fair hearing, and to be open to different points of view. That skill is really lacking in our civil society today. There's very little civility in civil society. And if you want to put the mortar back in between the blocks, it has to be this bedrock respect for you're completely different than I am. I don't even understand your point of view. I don't know how you can believe that, but I respect you, I listen to you, I, and I, you know, all of those things we've lost, we're losing that in our society. And as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we're under covenantal responsibility to bring that back because that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, I'm gonna conclude with 16 things that you can do that will put the human back in humanitarian, or put the civil back in civil society. When you fast, it's not just about giving the money. You can give the money, but why do we have to go without eating ourselves for the empathy? For the, for the small sacrifice, that small drop of sacrifice that says, I'm in this enough with you and I'm trying to have enough empathy with you. So the Lord doesn't just accept our money. He accepts our offering, which is the fasting that we do. And I pray every time I fast that the Lord will open up my heart to the people who don't have enough, who are hungry for something else, and let me be that food, and let me have that empathy to do it. The second thing is to volunteer consistently. We all volunteer according to our situations, and there's no guilt. But agencies cry for somebody who will be there every Tuesday at 4 o'clock. Why is that important to them? Because the kid in third grade that you're helping with the worksheet doesn't need the worksheet so much as they need a friend, a mentor, somebody who's the same person that they can count on because they maybe come from a situation where they don't have a lot of that. So the consistency of volunteering is one level up, and I think uh, it's important to talk about that. Cultivate sincere friendship with somebody who's younger than you or older than you. Kind of bridging the generational divide is also very important, especially for people younger. Imagine what it would have meant to you if a college student had become your friend and been interested in what you were doing and sincerely cared about you and be that for somebody else. Talk to your mayor or your city council and learn about their priorities. This is the when people say, I don't know what to do. I always say, go talk to your school or go talk to your mayor and just listen to what they have to say. And then you won't have that question anymore because you'll have ideas about what to do. Number five, learn a skill, teach a skill. You are doing fantastic things at school and you're, you're developing skills every single day. How fun is it to learn a new skill from somebody else or to teach somebody a skill? For civil society, I always I love the idea of noticing someone on the, on the periphery, on the edge, and then try and bring them to the center. And you'll notice in the scriptures how often Jesus did this. He will see somebody who is not participating in society and has a barrier for whatever reason, and he stops the whole crowd and he turns everybody's attention to that person and he brings them in. Hopefully that over and over again in the scripture is showing us, this is what I want you to do. This is a quote by President Monson. Never let a problem be solved become more important than a person we love. This is my friend from the Middle East saying, I'm going to use my project to build my relationship because that's the most important thing. You've got President Nelson saying, resolve a conflict in your life. Be a peacemaker and turn around and use it in your own family and resolve a conflict with somebody that you, you need to build that bridge with. All right. 
Find the fun in being a minister. It doesn't have to be a duty and a boring chore. And it can be fun, and you are smart enough to make it be fun. So figure out how to do that. Pray for people that you see on the news. There's a scripture in James 5 that says, I'm quoting maybe 40, but it says, the effectual, fervent prayer of a person availeth much. A righteous man. A righteous man availeth much. And I say a righteous woman. <laughs> You, there is a power in people who believe in the power of prayer that you can affect change on a place that you can never go simply by praying and exercising your faith. And if you want to learn more about that, go read the Brother of Jared. All right? Invite someone from another faith or another viewpoint to do something with you. And just chat. Just talk. Do something together. Number 12 needs a little explanation. But if there is a certain kind of meditation where they, they say, you have to have your liver smiling, not just your face, not just that, but just that inner being from the inside. And when you think about it, and it happens to me every time, your face will relax and your liver will be smiling. And it's that, it's that benevolent feeling toward other people rather than, why do they do this? And all that inner dialogue that goes on, my liver is smiling. <laughs> and I'm going to think the best of you. <laughs> and I'm going to look forward to getting to know you while my liver smiles. <laughs> These are the last four. Try to make life accessible. There's lots of different kinds of accessibility, but think about that. What can we do to be more inclusive and more accessible to other people? Learn about nutrition and food. This is my current passion. There's so much that we can do in our own culture around helping people have better access. And by any small act, you'll be contributing to the priority that President Nelson is setting for the whole global church. Be proactive about emergency preparedness. And then here's my final one. Every morning, get on your knees and pray for the Lord to send you to somebody. If you did just that thing, if you just said, I'm available, send me to someone, I will respond, and you did that every single day, your life would have been in service of the Master, and he would have sent you as a steward, somebody he could trust, every single day. So I want that. I'll just close by saying, if you do those 16 things, you're going to know what to do with the money. That provides the insight that you need, and you won't need a lot of money, but it requires some, and you'll know what to do. I'll close by saying, you know, we used to be named Latter-day Saint to charities. It was the charitable love of the Latter-day Saints. And that comes from this scripture, and we use it a lot in the church. But charity suffereth long. It's patient, it's kind. And all things will fail, but charity endureth forever. If you want to have impact in this world, if you want to do something that lasts, if you want to be a person who changes the world, charity never fails. Charity will be along forever. So I just bear you my witness. It's been the greatest privilege of my life to have anything to do with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints humanitarian efforts. And I get to represent you sometimes when I meet with the government or when I meet with a community that's doing something. But I know who gave the money, and I know who's, who's uh, behind me as I do that representation. I'm trying every day to do it faithfully for the Lord, and so will you. So are you, because we're all in this together. We're all representatives. Thank you for building civil society by relationship, by humanity, by civility, and by covenant. You have work to do, and the Lord will help you do it. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. amen so much. I was just thinking some of these issues, we're on a good track, right? It's going to take a long time to get there, but we're going in the right direction. Are there areas that you see that we're going in the wrong direction, where things are getting worse or we're losing ground? That's such a good question. <clears throat> in a lot of ways, we're, we're, we're at the mercy of the forces in our society. We, we sit in a larger society. And so things like climate change and conflict, you know, some of those barriers that I showed, they're all getting worse. Every indicator is showing that they're getting worse. And But it's interesting to me that you'll have somebody like Bishop Cosse, who stands up in conference and gives a very interesting talk about caring for the earth and environmental sustainability, something we haven't heard from the conference pulpit in a long time. And when, when a when a, somebody who has prayed over a conference talk, and it's tricky, stands up and does that, I believe it, it, there's, a, there's a spiritual shift in momentum 
as 17 million members of the church and, and other friends start paying attention to that. We all study that. So although those indicators are all getting worse, the supply chain issues, conflict, climate, inequities, uh, and, and, and gender, there are forces within the spiritual lives that we have where the Lord shifts them and says, all right, we need some extra power over here. And I think he directs things by the levers that he pulls. I don't know if that's a good answer, but thank you. It's a good question. I'm Elizabeth Carrick, um, and I also study environmental science. Um, and my question kind of has to do with Dr. Abbott's question also, but um, since you mentioned climate change and environmental inequities that make social issues worse, I wonder what the church, or especially the humanitarian branch of the church, is doing to deal specifically with the environmental issues and how have you seen that in your work? There are a lot of ways that I can answer that question, but I'll probably try and think about food. Because vulnerable populations are trying to grow food or, or access food in very difficult uh, environmental conditions, and it continues to get worse, a lot of the progress that we can make through technologies is how to grow better seed, how to be more water wise, how to teach those very specific skills to the people who are actually growing the food so that they have a harvest, they have enough seed, they can get their food to market, and they can feed their own families nutritious food. And so it's getting the technology and the learning that we have already found out, we don't have to figure it out, into the hands of the people who can use it the most. And so I think there's, that's where the opportunity is. So at Humanitarian Services, all of our projects are focused on how do, we, how do we build up their knowledge base? Not just bring in food or seed or fertilizer, but how do we empower them to have more ability? And then how do we stay with them while they practice and learn? And we're going to learn some things about that too, because we don't know everything. And then share those successes in the next situation, which may be similar, but, but in a different location also. It's a very, very good question. I hope you apply your brain to that. Hey, my name is Kim Fisher. I'm studying Middle Eastern Studies in Arabic. Um, I just wanted to ask your advice on, as you're doing international development type projects, how you're able to respect like, the local culture and traditions and religion while still providing aid and support. This question goes back to that UNO principle that I've talked about. If you feel like you have an answer to somebody, let's say you believe that female genital mutilation is wrong and it should never be practiced, and that's your belief, but you're working in a community where people are practicing it and have for a long time and they have very strong cultural reasons why they, how do you think you're going to change their mind? You can't unless they want to change. And so your job is to bring information and experiences and be along with them as they're on their journey about, can we continue this practice? But nothing about you lecturing them from your morality on their side is going to change their behavior. So that, that principle that I talked about, what is it that they want? I'll give you an example. I'm sorry that I chose that GM, but but there were two, there, were, there, was, there was a location in Ethiopia where there was a lot of FGM being practiced. And when they sat down with the religious leaders, they said, what would it take to not have this be the practice? Is there any condition where you wouldn't do it? And they said, well, the reason, one of the great reasons we do it is that the village over there won't marry our young girls if, if you know, we don't do this cultural practice. They said, if we got consensus from these villages around you that we would change the marriaging practice. Would that be enough? And they said yes. And that was one of the few successes in that, pro in that project where they were able to change it because they said, what is it you really need? And then how can we accommodate that? But you will never change somebody's ability their, around their cultural practice just by lecturing them from your moral viewpoint. It will never, ever happen. It has to be what they want. Yes. Are we, I'm a European Studies student right now. Um, I, you know, we were talking a lot about the positive things that can happen, but sometimes it can be super overwhelming to pick one. It feels like maybe sometimes I don't have the strength to do all that I want to do. So how can I, I mean, maybe I'm speaking for multiple people, but how can I find kind of a hope in some of these dire situations? And work and use that hope to, to build on to doing other projects as well. Thank you, Abby. When we live in a time of so much 
access to information. You're, you're seeing every night I look down and read the news and, I, and I'm getting information from all over the world about all these problems and I just can't breathe. I get claustrophobic. And I feel responsible. What should my agency be doing? What should I be doing? There's only certain things that we can do, and there's a lot of things that we can't do. So how do you not get depressed and overwhelmed and, and quit? The only way that I've found in my life is to turn back to Jesus Christ and say, this is your world, these are your people, this is your church, and I'll do anything that I can in front of me that you've inspired me to do, but the birth of it has to be on him. We don't have strength, we don't have the ability, we don't have the resources. There's too much need, so it has to be in Jesus Christ, and you can turn your faith to Him and ask Him to bear that burden and thank Him for it, and then commit to do your part. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, Abby. <laughs> I probably read a little bit too much news. <laughs> I'm Sabrina, and I'm a nursing student, and I'm actually from Switzerland. But I love the Just Surf app here in Utah. It's so big, switching from all the other topics, I guess. Uh, but I love the Just Surf app here. I use it in Europe, though, a lot of times, and it's not that great. How is it administratively organized uh, internet and international view, and how can we improve it? Or what can, I don't know, also non members opportunities or something like that? Thank you. Just Serve sort of works, and it works well in the United States because we have a lot of church members who have callings, and they go out and visit agencies, and they fill that up, and they kind of promote it. But in a place like Puerto Rico, where there's 1,800 members of the church, how is that going to, to work in your experience in Europe? Uh, so we've decided that it can't just be borne by members of the church. We're going to have to go to our faith partners, and the Red Cross, and, and all of our humanitarian agencies and say, look, if, let's do projects together and let's post on Just Serve. It's free, it's global, and, and we can do that. And by that way, it will increase. So as soon as we have this technology update, we will start then following that, that strategy so that it won't just be born on members of the church. It'll be a, a true community effort. And we, we hope that it'll go forward. But any ideas as a user that you have of ways to make it simpler or easier for other people to interact, we, we welcome it. Thank you. Thank you to everybody.